Look at this. Why don't more people use Linux? How much do you want to bet this is going to be the greatest article of all time? Because you know what? It's going to turn into a jing yang roast of Ehrlich Bachman. You are fat and poor. <laughs> I am so ready. A couple weeks ago, I saw a tweet asking, if Linux is so good, why aren't more people using it? Yeah, seen getting dunked on. And dude, even got Elon Musk to be like, well, actually, I mean, that's such a good tweet to get your boss to respond to it. Okay, his boss just responded to him, be like, yo, dog, a lot of people use it. Uh, anyways, and it's a fair question. It's uh, intuitively rings true until you give it a moment, moment's consideration. Linux is even free. So what's stopping mass adoption if it's actually better? Uh, before I read his response, one thing that I did, one of my kind of like heart changes that I had with development in 2015, it's really the reason why I'm streaming as part of this heart change. One of the heart changes is that I deploy and run things on Linux, yet I use a Mac. I want to use the thing I deploy on. I want to get familiar with it to the point where I can reasonably go on and, and attempt to figure out what's happening. And so I just started learning it. I mean, that was my personal motivation. It wasn't like oh, free and open source software. Oh, it wasn't like all the other things people do. It was because I just wanted to simply use the thing that I use all the time in production. You felt the same? Yeah. And so it's like, I'm not a fantastic Linux user. I've never been a fantastic Linux user. I just, I, I use it because I want to use it. 777 enjoyers. Yeah. In fact, I even I believe I asked a question about 777 on Stack Overflow at one point. Anyways, let's let's see this one. My response: If exercising is so healthy, why don't more people do it? If reading is so educational, why don't more people do it? If junk food is so bad for you, why do so many people eat it? It's a fair question. You do two out of three of those things. Do two? Uh, yes. Um, I go, <laughs> It's the reading part, huh? Yeah, I can't really read either. Uh, it's not a fair question. And what I mean by a fair question is that things that are good for you are extremely difficult to do. If you deploy in production, why aren't you adept with the system you use? I think that's a fair question. If you use it for every other person to, to play with it, but you yourself don't use it, is there a conflict of interest? But to also be fair, this has an underlying kind of like implied axiom, which is that Linux is good for you. Linux should be the thing you, you deploy on. Now, personally, I think that's true. But some people actually deploy on Windows. So I'm just saying. It sounds a bit manipulative. Do you think it sounds manipulative? It well, it's, it's making an underlying assumption that Linux is actually the, the thing that should be used. Therefore, if you're not using it, it's like, oh, well, it's the thing we run all of our servers on, but I don't do it. The world is full of free innovation, uh, inv uh, invitations to self-improvement that are ignored by most people most of the time. Putting it crudely, it's easier to be fat and ignorant of the world of cheap, empty calories than it is to be fit and informed. It's hard to resist the temptation of minimal effort. I, I mean, that's obviously an objectively true statement. It is easier. It is 100% easier to all... I mean, we do this all the time to ourselves. We, uh, the shortcut... I mean, every last person here has had the battle with the higher will and the lower will on doing the thing you should do versus the thing that you want to do. Everybody here who works out has even had the desire not to work out as hard, knowing fully that they're deciding not to work out as hard. It's not that they're failing. They're not doing as well, right? We all, I mean, this is an objectively true statement in of itself. It's relating it to Linux that I think is a little difficult. I'm having a hard time seeing the bridge to Linux. Minimal effort equals faster. Well, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't even equal faster. Sometimes it is slower. Doing the minimal effort can, can be slower because you're every single day you're getting interrupted for, say, like 30 seconds because you do the minimal thing as opposed to taking two hours to make it just work. And so then you pay that cost over and over again because it is faster in the short term, but it's not faster in the long term, right? Uh, Linux isn't minimal effort. Facts. It's an operating system that demands more of you than does the commercial offerings from Microsoft and Apple. Thus, it serves as a dojo for understanding computers better. You will walk away with better understanding of an operating system. That's, I, I think we all agree that you can use Windows and virtually never know what a file is. I think that's pretty, that's pretty fair. With a sensei who keeps demanding you figure out problems on your own in order to learn and level up. Like, my kids don't even know what files really are. Uh, my oldest is starting to understand that there's files, but you meet, like, a lot of 15, 16, 17-year-olds that actually don't even know what a file or a directory is. Like, that, those, those things don't even have words, right? Like, they're not even real. It does teach you a lot. Everything is fine. I know, I know you want that to be true, but in, in kids' head, there is no such thing as a file. Files don't even exist. 
Uh, who's the audience for this article? People who know who DHH is? He's preaching to the choir. Of course he's preaching to the choir. It's, it's literally his blog. A blog is preaching to the choir. A blog is taking your thoughts and putting it out there for people to read. <laughs> now, I totally understand why most computer users aren't interested in intellectual workout when all they want to do is browse the web or use an app. Also fair, I would never, ever, for any reason, set my mom up to use Linux. It would be an actual, I would have a mental illness if I said, you know what, mom, you need to use Linux because it is the best way to use the computer, right? Like my mom just doesn't need that. I don't need that. And so not everybody needs to use Linux. And that's completely fair. They're not looking to become a black belt in computing fundamentals, but programmers are different or ought to be different. Ooh, ooh, there's an implied morality here. It's kind of an interesting thing, which is, and this is a very huge, I think, contention in our modern world right now, which is, what is better, to deliver an app as fast as possible or to write something well? It's very hard to do them, obviously, at the same time. And I think a lot of us want to write it well, but we're often compelled by money or time to get it out quick. And you can see this with older houses. Houses built in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s, though the layout often is like they were taking acid, the houses gen generally are built better. Because there was more concern of craft than speed during those years. They were probably taking acid. Yeah, it's true. I would also add houses in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, typically houses in the 30s and 40s are uh, a little bit more interesting because they're getting old enough that, you know, sometimes you need like foundational help and all that. Uh, you know, as houses get older, they can, uh, they need help. Our house is 113 years old and can withstand a nuclear blast. Yeah, but you probably have had a lot of things go into it. You probably also had tube electronics at one point. As Thor said... Nobody cares if it has 10, 10K in if statements as far as it gets the job done. Yes. The problem is, is we, the consumer, are concerned about results. We, the builder, are concerned about the quality. And so it gets into this really weird spot. Computers are by far the weirdest place. You, you, like, you truly don't care. I know people are saying, I care. You truly don't care when it comes to the consumer side. You want Twitter to work. Does it matter that Twitter is shooting lasers inside of some crazy light-based programming language? Or does it matter that it's written in PHP? You, would, you, would, you, just, you wouldn't care. You'd have no actual care at all how it's done, long as it was consistent and always worked. And so as a consumer, we are just not caring. But as a producer, we definitely care. And that, it becomes this really difficult. Fucking lasers, man, right? It becomes really difficult because we're on both sides. PHP is legit. No hate there. Yeah, I mean, I think P I've already talked about my my past with PHP. Uh, they are they are like firefighters. Fitness isn't the purpose of firefighting, but it's a prerequisite. You are a better firefighter when you have stamina and strength to carry people out of a burning builder on building on your shoulders. If uh, than if you do not. So most firefighters work to be fit in order to serve that mission. This is actually actually a pretty interesting analogy. I, I like it in the sense that to become a good programmer. The more you know of fundamentals, the ability to go further down the stack, the more you just simply understand, the faster you can move even in the simple things. And that takes time, effort, and difficulty, but it, it can yield better output. Yeah, I know. I understand that most firefighters just take medical calls. That is because whenever there is somebody that says has a heart attack and the doors are locked, there's certain ways in which they need to be able to break things in and all that. I get that firefighters aren't responding to fires all the time. They actually do a lot of services. Car wrecks typically have firefighters because you have to be able to get people out of cars and all that. But nonetheless, they still have to be in shape. Just because we build CRUD apps responding to medical calls doesn't mean we don't also have complex things in which we're trying to build. That's why I love to see more developers take another look at Linux, such that they may develop better proficiency in the basic katas of the internet, such that they aren't scared to connect a computer to the internet without the cover of a cloud. Interesting. Besides, if you're able to figure out how to set up modern build pipeline for JavaScript or even correctly configured IM for AWS, you already have all the stamina you need for the Linux journey. That is such a good take. If you can do a JavaScript build pipeline, you can use Linux. Like, we're not talking about, I do, I go like Vite init and I create a new basic template. We're talking about a larger project in which has custom build points and all of that. We're not talking about the easy stuff, right? Think about giving it another try. Not because it's easy, because it's worth it. I would say this is the exact same thing when it comes to data structures, when it comes to algorithms, learning about how HTTP works, uh, building your own custom uh, you know, network protocol. Not because you should do that because it's somehow going to benefit you at your job, but you should do that because you will understand how the internet protocols work. 
when you build something in binary, you understand things at a more fundamental level. You understand how JSON actually even works. How do you send an object across a wire? Some people are completely mystified, probably even in this chat. Type one in this chat if you are mystified by the process of sending JSON across the wire. I bet you there's at least quite a few people that just they just don't know how and they don't understand why. Would you like a, would you like a brief lesson in how it works? Let's just say that you have an object. It has several key value properties on this. What's going to happen is that the JSON stringification process is going to walk through the properties and the values and turn them into strings. So this thing goes from an object into a string that approximately represents the exact same set of keys and their values. Okay, so this is called the serialization process. This part is not too complicated to understand. Uh, in the sense that you probably understand that every single object has a bunch of properties. You understand that those properties can be set, and you kind of get the process. I'm going to move Twitch chat off the side for a second. All right, so now that we kind of got the easy part done, that's called serialization. Uh, if you're curious about how that works, go to json.org, and you can actually see this thing right here. This is literally how it goes. Object goes in. You make a squirrely brace. You can do a, you can do a white space. Then you have to stringify it. And then you have to do a white space, and then you got to do a, a semicolon or a colon, and then the value. The value can be done right here. A value is a white space, a string, number, object, or array, true, false, or null. This is how a string is encoded. Sorry, I have dark readers on because the website looks crazy without it. Look, look, look at this. Look at this thing go. Hold on. There you go. Uh, here's a number. Here's all the things for decoding a number. Like each one is just reading something one at a time. It's really not that bad how serialization versus deserialization works. But this isn't the confusing part. Here's the confusing part that I think a lot of people don't understand. There's something called TCP. Th typically, this is what your internet runs on, though UDP is becoming more popular. But for the sake of this, let's just call it TCP because UDP just implements an algorithm that's a lot like TCP to be able to do the same thing. TCP is reliable. And what that means is that if I send a data payload that looks like A, B, C, and say this takes five packets to actually send this data. On the other side of the, of the whole network cloud, here's the big cloud, right? On the other side, you will receive the data out in A, B, C, all right? You'll get it in the order in which you send it. So therefore, if I send this string, which could take many packets, it would be sent through on the other side. But there's a problem, okay? There's a very big problem with that. And the problem is actually quite simple. If I send a JSON object, how do I know the JSON object ends? How do I know how big this data is on the other side? Is it ordered? Yes, it's ordered. It's reliable. It comes in ordered and it prevents loss. So how do I know this is happening? Well, remember TCP just, all it deals with is binary, right? It's just ones and zeros. If you send 10K ones and zeros across the wire in a specific order, the other side receives those 10K in that specific order. Now, some people are saying, well, braces, it starts with the brace, right? Why would you ever do that? Why would you ever make a binary algorithm that relies, say, on a brace? What you do instead is you say, okay, this thing is 10K long. All right, so my binary protocol will actually have a couple items in front. One, say, could be the version or some sort of book bookkeeping information. Two, the next byte or the next two bytes or the next three bytes could be dedicated to the length of the object. Okay, this thing's 10K long. We're gonna need to fill it in with the value, which would take two bytes. So we have a nice little header that says, hey, the next message you're reading is this long because you could get responded to from TCP with two messages. Maybe it responds with one and a half messages because that's just how it happens. And so you have to keep track of this message, but this message has already been sent and parsed out. So you just read that part and then you read the next amount out and then you can JSON deserialize it. And this is effectively how HTTP works in some set. This is just like the basics of any transport is that you have to know the length so that you can reconstruct it. TCP gives you reliable in order transport. Your application style, like say HTTP, gives you the meaning of that data. So HTTP has a bunch of headers on top that's like, okay, this is a response. It's from this path. Here's some headers. Here's some information about it. Here's the content length, right? The length is this long. And then it takes that and reads that out. And it, they all end with slash R slash N. And then the body is two slash R slash Ns in a row. So like when you're reading 
HTTP, you actually know that you're you're done with the headers by getting these two bytes in a row. There's some acts in there. We're not talking about the TCP style instead of things. There you go. So like that's the basic of how these things work. Now, is that hard? Is that complicated? Does that take a whole bunch of time? It's hard if you have no programming basics. But if you have programming basics, you understand how an int is stored in memory, then understanding how to transport stuff, it's not that bad. It really becomes pretty easy. Would be nice if you wrote an HTTP server in C. Would be nice if you wrote an HTTP server in C. I actually learned this at the university and how to send files from one computer to another. It actually was super uh, fun and useful. It is. It's super good. If you've never built your own transport protocol, just do it. Create a server that takes in TCP connections. Build a client that it creates TCP connections. Then try sending something across. See what happens. Then you're like, okay, so how do I parse out meaningful chunks of data? Well, I'm going to need a length. I'm going to need maybe a message type so I understand the type of message being sent because maybe you have many different types of messages. Um, uh, just so you know, something that we will be doing very, very soon here is that I will be taking this, and this will actually be probably today or tomorrow. We're going to be designing our game server architecture, and it's going to be written in Go and Zig is generally kind of where I'm leaning. Go will be the game authentication slash routing server. Zig will be the uh, game, will be the actual game. And so we're gonna develop this way for like, say Go to be able to send messages to a game server and say, hey, we're done here, let's close things down. We have to be able to send up connections to this Go server. The Go server is gonna have to be able to go, okay, what are all the game servers we have? Okay, here's the game servers we have. All right, it looks like we're gonna have to shut some of these down because these game servers aren't being used anymore. So no more connections to those servers. And when there's no more connections, let's shut them down because we don't need them anymore. Our, our stuff is uh, is not used as much, right? Like just building all the auto scaling. I'm gonna build my own auto scaling because I think that that would be more fun than trying to learn a product because I've never auto scaled in my lifetime. And so I've only ever used auto scaling. I've never built auto scaling. So I'm just gonna build my own. I think it'd be a lot more fun anyways. Uh, thank you, thank you, Hef. And I love this. I love this mentality. And I think this is a mentality that more people need to adopt, which is you don't have to know how something works all the way through. But it's okay to go one level deeper. Just one. Go one level deeper. See how it works. See what it feels like. See if you see if you have a good see if you have a good experience. And then maybe you have a horrible experience. And the reason why you have a horrible experience is because you have no experience at it. And then you go and you look at how libraries do it and how other people do it. And you go, oh wow, oh, that makes total sense. I had this problem. Now I understand how they got here. It's the same thing with just using Linux. Linux is just vastly different than using something else. You're going to install Docker, and then Docker, when you try to run it, it's going to go, ah, it doesn't work. And you're going to go, why doesn't it work? Ah, because you need to create a Docker user group for Docker to be able to do these things. Okay, I'm going to create a user group. Ah, it still doesn't work because your user is not in the user group. And you're going to have to just do that. You're going to have to execute those two commands you always have to execute when installing Docker. You just need to know why they happen. And it's good. It's good for you. It helps you become better at computers and faster and nicer. You just get things. You get things at a more fundamental level. And the more you get things at a more fundamental level, the better life typically is for a programmer. Right? I mean, look at this. This person's obviously done it enough times that just, just knows it right off the rip. Anyways, I really like this article. I really do like this article because I think for a long time, I was kind of scared about Linux. When I was deploying my first ever startup, it was a Linux machine. It was a LAMP stack. And I always felt so confused using it. Now it feels like the terminal just feels like the natural place I should be. The name is the primogen.